my buddy stops, Shuey, he's leading the patrol and, and uh, he takes a knee and, and I get over and take a knee next to a tree and he looks back at me, he just looks at me, he goes, do you hear that? And I kind of just lean in and that's when it all kicks off. You know, Alec Akbar, and all hell breaks loose. The tree explodes next to me, just rapid machine gun fire shooting right down into us. And uh, I took shrapnel to the eye in my face. That was when I was, the first time I was wounded in the battle. I ended up taking shrapnel along my, my nose, my face, my I've almost lost my eye, uh, cut my face, everything like that. <clears throat> and then uh, we returned fire, just volleyed fire back. So it was just volley of fire just going back and forth. Had to get them off our, off our back. My radio was gone. It's, I can't communicate. You know, we're in the middle of this valley, surrounded on all sides. And that's when everything really opened up. And that's when they really started to hit us. And I just remember, saying to myself, you're not dead yet, so keep fighting. That was it, that's all that went through my head. You are about to embark upon the great crusade to meet this mounting aggression. And make no mistake about it, good will prevail. I was uh, born in Fairmont, Minnesota, and so a Midwest boy, and uh, um, basically my, my uh, grandparents had served in the military, so they were both in the Marine Corps. One was in the Pacific on the USS Lexington as a as a pom pom gunner or anti aircraft gunner, and then my uh, on my mother's side, uh, my grandfather was in the Korean War. So he was infantry, but he ended up doing uh, uh, I think he drove with the general and also did typing, but he was also going back and forth to the front a lot. Um, but that influenced me uh, a little bit through my childhood, and I was kind of was drawn to watching the History Channel a lot, like going over to my, my uh, uh, grandparents' house and, and just, they had cable, so I just love watching History Channel. So I learned a lot about like World War II and like that era in the 90s. And then as a filmmaker and, and loving movies, I always was drawn to war films and you know acts of heroism and like what people do under fire and the, you know the, the bravery and the, the Band of Brothers, all that, all those themes. So as I was uh, growing up, I you know, learn more and more about the military. Uh, the Marine Corps infantry was renowned as the best infantry in the world and the hardest fighting force and, you know, all these things. So uh, when I went in or when I uh, was making my choices, you know, it helped the influence that my grandparents were both Marines. So I made the decision um, my senior year because both Iraq and Afghanistan was going on that this was the time to join and to really prove myself. Um, I had influences through high school that, you know, Really, if I, I wanted to be the best, I want to go where the best are, and that was the Marine Corps Infantry. And uh, I wanted to fight, hold a gun, do all that stuff, especially when you're like you're, you're a kid. So that re what really drove me to become the war, be, be a part of the warrior class. Like I think that's something that we see in both literature and film, and film and storytelling, is that consistence of every generation of is the warrior class, and to be a part of that is an honor. And but it's also very difficult. It's painful. There's a lot of sacrifice. Um, so I kind of, I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be a part of that special group. And, um, and I didn't know if I had what it took. And that's kind of what I think everybody, you know, has to ask themselves or prove to themselves. That first day when we're going to our platoon, everyone's freaked out. No one knows what's going on. It's the, you know, the fear of the unknown. And I remember just being like, holy shit, I'm doing it. This is it. I'm becoming a Marine. Like this surreal feeling, but also of, of excitement. And, um, and then it was Black Friday and all, you know, the drone stickers come out, start throwing every, all of our gear everywhere. They start ripping our bunks apart. And it's just chaos for the first few weeks. And you just don't know what's, you know, just lockstep, get your stuff done. You know you're not gonna do it right. So, you know, you get hazed, you get, you know, court, you know uh, PT, quarter decked, all that stuff. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was really cool uh, going through that experience and then learning more and more. And honestly, it was just, it, when we started doing more of the combat stuff, that's when, they don't do a lot of it in boot camp, but when you do it, it's like, it's, it's fun. Like we were, you know, they played the Omaha beach scene on a loudspeaker, like on loop. And they just like made us crawl around with like M16s and would like shoot blanks at us every once in a while. And I thought it was the coolest thing ever, you know? And, um, but yeah, once you go through boot camp, obviously it's a there's a lot of pride involved, uh, discipline, you know how you look, regulations, all that stuff. So coming out of boot camp, you know you're God's gift to the earth, and you you totally drink the Kool Aid and and everything. So, but even in boot camp, you know it was a it's a journey that I never planned on going through life like for like a career. It was just it was a goal I wanted to meet. And so by the end of boot camp, I was already like, oh shit, like. 
man, I got like three and a half more years of that, or you know, well over three and a half years of this to go. And um, so I was uh, uh, a little like, ah, damn it. Well, now I'm, now I'm going to be a Marine tomorrow. You know, I, I go back home, but now I got three and a half years to, <laughs> to keep going with this bullshit. <laughs> so, but it was, uh, it was great. And, um, you know, the ra reality starts sinking in even more after boot camp because that's when the rubber really meets the road. You know, that's when you go to infantry school and we, you start to realize the difference in culture in the Marine Corps from people who are infantry and then people who are not. And that got put into, instilled into us right away. We got into infantry school. They're like, hey, we're going to, we have to train you for war. This is no bullshit. This isn't regulations. This isn't, you know, uh, drilling. This isn't, you know, slapping rifles around and looking good. You're going to war. And we need to train you to go to war. And a lot of that stuff goes out the window. American Military University is a proud sponsor of this video. AMU is excited to announce a 10% veteran grant for eligible veterans and their families, which can be applied to undergraduate and master level courses. I personally love AMU because I took many courses on my deployments to Afghanistan that really helped me get a head start when I left the military. For more information and eligibility, follow the link in the description below. We deployed to Iraq in March 2006. And uh, we had the Haditha Triad. So it was Hakania, Haditha, and Barwana, uh, right off the Haditha Dam. I believe it was the Euphrates River we were on. I was, for some reason, I always got it mixed up, but I'm pretty sure we were on the Euphrates River. And uh, my company, Lima Company, which was I, I was assigned to, I was uh, in Barwana, most of the deployment. Um, that, uh, the 2006 deployment to Iraq was pretty much set the standard for misery and pain um, that what we went through. It was, you know, um, we were in the middle of a city. It was hot as hell. It was 110, 120 degrees. You know, 13 guys to a room that's, you know, the size of a regular bedroom stacked up on top of each other. Um, you know, patrolling 24-7, uh, you know, maybe getting two, three hours of sleep. And then when you did sleep, it was actually inside of Iraqi houses that you'd take over for the afternoon or the night to hold security. And then we just keep moving. We, we just go out for four days straight and just wouldn't come back and then, you know, refit, come back. And then we'd stand post for six hours at a time, which doesn't seem like that bad of a deal. But when you haven't slept in weeks, it's brutal to sit on, in a post that's 120 degrees and then you have to wear full body armor. And, you know, you're up from 10, you know, 10, uh, 10, a, 10 p.m. or midnight to 6 a.m. in the morning. It sucks. Um, the misery and just like our, our nerves were on fire the whole time. We were getting hit with IEDs, dismounted IEDs, so not even vehicle-borne IEDs. The guys in our mobile section just were getting slammed, and then we were getting slammed with, with uh, dismounted IEDs, snipers, snipers taking pop shot at all the time. And so <clears throat> it was just your nerves were constantly on fire because we were always reactive. You know, we, we'd, it didn't matter what was going on. We weren't high speed. We weren't like running around a corner, hitting a building and going home. It was, you're going to patrol this area for the next eight hours. Whatever happens to you, happens to you. And you're basically either drawing fire or you're patrolling to make sure that things are secure. Um, and so it was just highly nerve wracking, incredibly exhausting. And then uh, we were also getting mortared every day. So we're taking indirect fire constantly. Uh, they zeroed our fob in with 120 millimeter mortars. And they got really accurate and they got really good at it. At one point, they blew up our fuel farm. They blew up our generator. They would hit our posts, blow our posts up. Um, they landed it right in the middle of our, our base and it was blown out all the tires. And the base wasn't very big. It was maybe the half, half the size of a football field, about two schoolhouses that we took over. So it wasn't anything formal. And um, yeah, at one point, we had a motor round basically blow through my door. And we had a bunch of guys like we, we ran inside and the more hit right outside and shot shrapnel right into our door, like right into our, right where I lived, right into my room. So I had my buddies, you know, they got hit. And so we had blood all over the floor where I slept like a foot away. And, and so you just had to deal with all that type of stuff. And it was just, it, we didn't shower for seven months. I had one good shower in seven months, so one time. Other than that, it was water bottle shower. We barely cleaned our, our camis. They could stand up on their own. You know, some of those small details that they just don't tell you about, you know, in combat and war, it's like, just how miserable and how much you smell, <laughs> you don't notice it, and you know unless you're outside of the bubble. Um, and uh, so that really was it, it set a high threshold of misery and pain, and both mentally and psychologically. Um, you know, you, you look back on it and you're like, I can't believe I went through that. But just like everything else, you take it day by day. 
you know, um, you, you can't think about it all at once because it'll it'll overwhelm you. Um, so, um, you know, that was it was sucked too because we we'd gotten all the way through the deployment, and you know, a good friend of mine was killed about a week before we left, and then um, we had another. Uh, I didn't know him as well, but another guy that was close to everybody was killed, Estrada. Uh, Miller, my friend Miller, was killed a, about week before we left and then Estrada was killed on the last mission. We were already in Al Assad and he was on the last patrol coming back in the map section and an IED got him. So, and it was a rough time in Iraq too. Two, three relieved us and they were getting absolutely hammered, just absolutely hammered. I think they lost multiple guys before we even left country. So, um, so that was really the height of the war. That was pre-surge. And so, you know, we came back and we got a chip on our shoulder and we were, um, you know, I was, I knew, I, I was, I don't know, lack of a better word, tweaked out or whatever, but you know, you're young and you want to get back into the fight. So we just, I put all that energy back into training and uh, I wanted to go where the best were. I wanted to actually make a difference. I wanted to go and smoke, uh, you know, the, the bad guys with a sniper rifle and to kill IED emplacers and all that stuff. So, and to protect my boys. And I think that's kind of what it really came down to was being able to help and make a difference to help my guys on the ground. So I tried out for scout snipers uh, about a week after. They held the in-dock about a week after we got back. So right away, jumped right into it, uh, was uh, selected, uh, you know, and um, that was incredible. I mean, going through it, everyone was just, we we're all out of sorts. <laughs> so, you know, it was just a, a whirlwind. And they held the in-dock and we all, you know, I gave my best and, and um, you know, at the end of it, they're like, yep, we're gonna give you 30 days to prove yourself. And if you're, after that 30 days, we'll either decide to kick you out of the platoon or send you back to your, your unit or, or to your company. And then we're going to, uh, or we're gonna train you up and go to sniper school. And we'll keep you in the platoon. And I was like, holy shit, they're giving me an opportunity. Everything to me was an opportunity, so don't fuck it up. Like it was never, it never felt like, yeah, of course I belong here. I'm in amazing shape. I'm one of the best Marines here. Not at all. Like, you know, nothing ever really comes natural to me. I have to work hard. I have to work twice as hard as everyone else. And then the people that are up at that level, I have to work four to five times even harder than them. So I uh, <clears throat> just put all my heart and soul into everything, into that SIP program. I didn't go, never went out. I buried myself in all the uh, sniper knowledge. They, you know, they gave us basically the whole, the sniper pub, and I read that thing back to you know back back to back, front to back. Uh, they would go through it through it as well with us, but then I was constantly having cue cards, and we were going back and forth. Like I took it very very seriously, very seriously. And then they would train us, and then if we did something wrong, they would you know take us out on a ruck run for three four miles, and then set us back into the uh, into the uh, sniper hooch, and then start learning again and rewrite the you know <laughs> rewrite all the all the definitions and and uh, attention to detail and the Kim's games and they they did an amazing job training us. We even got to go out and get out on the stock lane to do some pre-training before we went to sniper school. So we built our ghillies and and you know started learning all the field craft of of being a scout sniper, which is also one of the biggest, uh, basically one of the biggest killers of guys going through school is stalking. That's like probably the hardest part. Shooting is actually pretty easy. Um, it's the stalking that really gets you. And so, because you either get it or you don't. Like you can, you can train somebody on it. If they don't get it, it's gonna take a long time for them to figure it out. Um, so you kind of have to figure it out quickly. And then if you don't, you know, it's just, it's just all about time and experience. And, and some guys just don't, they just don't get it. They just, they can't. But then there's guys that are the opposite. They're just ninjas. Like they just, it's in their head. They just like, oh yeah, I get it. And they're, they're like, you know, they're, they're a savant. And, and Scout Sniper School is notorious for a high attrition rate. I believe it was about 60%. So we got there and just from our unit, there were 12 guys that we sent from 3rd Battalion, 3rd Marines. And obviously there's other units there as well. But 3-3 sent 12 guys, and then four of us graduated. So I think that was really cool. I mean, it sucked for those guys that didn't make it, but you know, at the end of the course, our uh, Skinna, who was our, uh, uh, wasn't our chief scout, but he was like the, the lead instructor, you know, said to us, say, hey, you know, at the end of the day, he said, hey, you're a scout sniper. You have what it takes because you're still here. You know, and I, that meant a lot. It was like, he goes, we didn't think you guys were the ones that would make it, but clearly you did. And you are the ones that have what it takes to be a scout sniper because you're the one standing at the end here. You got everything. You proved everybody wrong. Um, and, you know, they, we weren't the studs. You know, we weren't the senior guys. We weren't the, you know, the fastest. We weren't the, the you know, all the, you know, 
some it was it was pretty wild. So to stand there and become a scout sniper and be you know given the hog's tooth and, and graduate, that was one of the biggest highlights of my career. And so we deployed with right after I graduated in March of 2007. I had a little about a week or two off, and then we started to train up again. And then by June, we were in pre-deployment training and combined arm exercise in 29 Palms, and I was in Iraq by the end of July. So we had about seven, eight months uh, between the last deployment and, and the next one, or so, roughly that. And uh, then we deployed to the Fallujah provinces. Uh, we Our main headquarters out of Camp Fallujah, but then we covered out on uh, Garma, Omar, and Zaydan. And uh, we would operate out of the, uh, out of, um, we'd operate out of Camp Fallujah, but m my team, 85 Charlie, we uh, operate mostly out of uh, Garma, so with Lima Company. And uh, that was uh, an awesome experience, uh, miserable. I was a radio operator, so I had to carry all the batteries. I was in the sniper hide because I was a scout sniper. I was part of the sniper element, but I had to do, you know, all the radio stuff, I hated radios, but radios are actually pretty awesome once you aren't you know, under the pain of a 100 pound ruck. Um, but my ruck was roughly 100 pounds. So inserting was an absolute nightmare. Um, and uh, I carried extra batteries for you know, five days worth of operations. We carried food for five days, and then we also had to carry ammunition for five days, and then I had to carry ammunition of the, uh, uh, of the sniper, am the, you know, the ammo for the sniper rifle. So it was, yeah, it was, Awesome to operate that. We were now suddenly the guys in the darkness creeping around. We were the ones, you know, that everyone was afraid of and, you know, inserting. And it, uh, it was really cool. It was really, it wasn't as uh, intense that deployment. So slightly disappointing on the aspect that we didn't get to, you know, go and smoke a ton of dudes or, or you know, um, do some big operations. By that point in 07, it, would, it was insane. It was like a, a light switch turned on and it went from, you know, Gar, uh, Fallujah provinces were absolutely insane to nothing, and it was really weird. And so that kind of sucked because we were just kind of sitting and, and, you know, for the base of the last half of the deployment, we were just, you know, playing Xbox and, and working out a lot and kind of figuring things out for the next stage in life, you know. Um, and my brother was about to deploy. So I'm coming home in February of 08. My brother's about to take off in uh, February of 08 to Afghanistan. And he's, we're on, you know, MySpace. I think MySpace, yeah, I think we were on MySpace or Facebook. And we we're just talking. He's like, he goes, hey, what, what's going on in Afghanistan? Like, we're going to this Afghanistan. And I, was, I laughed. I said, Afghanistan? I was like, nothing's going on in Afghanistan. I was like, you're going to be a boot for the rest of your career. <laughs> You'll never see combat. And I knew nothing about Afghanistan. And next thing I know, we get back and all hell is breaking loose in Afghanistan. So my brother was a part of 1-6 as a combat engineer. They called it the reinvasion of Helmand, and they just went down, and it was wild. It was insane. We were getting after-action reports from sniper platoons that were there, and we were reading them. We had the direct line into our emails and everything. And so then, it, it, after we had got back, and the, the combat advisors were, you know, they had asked, and I didn't quite know all that stuff. And then my brother, I was getting all his what he was doing, and then all these all these other messages. And we were like, we need to get to Afghanistan right now. Like they are killing platoon-sized element of Taliban on ambush, on sniper ambushes. They wouldn't go out without two teams because the, because the Taliban were so big, or like their, their units, their, their, their movement, the element size were so big that they didn't want to be overran. So the sniper elements would go out in two teams and just smoking dudes left and right. And so, and it was just absolute chaos. And so my brother was there and, and um, you know, I, I was trying to get over. I was like, how do we get to Afghanistan? How do we, you know, we thought, thought about, you know, is there a way to, to switch units? Is there a way to, to get on and help with combat replacements? You know, um, all this other stuff. So we were trying to figure stuff out and, and I heard about the combat advisors, my buddies were on them and they were like, this is gonna be awesome. We're gonna do this. I was like, Fuck, I should have, I should have, you know, volunteered for it or whatever. And to this day, I, I tell the story, I, to this day, I do not remember how I heard about someone dropping from the teams, from the ETT teams. And I, I absolutely was like, holy shit, I need to get on this team. So I heard about it. I ended up calling my buddy Maddie, and I'm like, yo, I heard somebody drop from the, the ETTs. And he goes, I don't know how you know about that. That was like an hour ago. And I, was, and I, I still to this day, I don't remember who told or what happened or how I even found out. I, I call up Herman, Staff Sergeant Herman. <clears throat> it was a good friend of mine now. And I said, hey, 
hold this slot for me. Do not let it go. I'm, I'm, I'm getting on this deployment. So yeah, so I got on the, on the advisor teams about halfway through their training cycle, and that was just, just a blast. I mean, we were just shooting Mark 19s, and then it was a very, uh, definitely a, a step above um, where I was at because they acted as if it were a special forces team. Because essentially that's kind of the mission, um, is it was supplementing the special forces guys who were standing up the commando brigades and special forces, Afghan special forces. So we took the infantry forces, which is what they initially did, the SF guys. Well, so now we have that mission. So they had tw about 20 man teams and in each team there's like a sub team, about three sub teams and then like a little headquarters element. So I was ETT 1TAC 11, so an embedded trainer team 1TAC 11. And um, our sister team was ETT 5TAC 4. Um, and those were the two Y teams, and I believe there's about five teams from Okinawa, Japan. Anyway, so yeah, so we, um, I was attached to a special forces team in July, or sorry, in June of 2009. And uh, I was with them for about a month until uh, we, until July 29th, 2009, which was the uh, battle for which I received the Silver Star. So the mission was basically to go as far as we can. And at this point, I was attached to a special forces team. So I was, with, I was in the lead with the SF team, and then we had some, uh, our, some of our Afghan counterparts, mine, my, my recon platoon. And then we had a kind of staggered down the road. We had elements of the AMP, and then also my buddies as well on the ETT. They were like in different positions. So, but there was one, one road in and one road out, out of Usman Valley, and it wasn't very good. So going in, there's no, you can't like go off the road. It's, it's very mountainous. It's all this stuff in, in, in kind of like somewhat Northeast Afghanistan. So the terrain was, is, was beautiful, but it was also treacherous. Like, and uh, there's no, if what the road went out, the road went out, you're not getting around it, you know? So we went, we were like, we needed to find out what was at the end of our valley. And we also knew that they were running weapons through the valley at one point, because once we got into the valley, we actually cut off a lot of the weapons supplies going into Kabul, which was great, but that the northern part of the valley we hadn't touched yet. And so my, uh, the team I was on, this SF team as well as ETT, we were like, we gotta, we gotta push in. Like, we gotta see where the road ends. So we kind of disguised it as a key leader engagement, but we also wanted to see who was up there. So it was kind of like a hybrid. We were like, all right, we're gonna do a key leader engagement. We're gonna find out the village elder, we're gonna talk with them, but we're also gonna take photos and kind of recon the area of how far this road goes. So that morning we stepped off about 3 a.m. and we drove all the way up and it was, it took us about probably two hours or so to make the movement and then we got to the end of the road, which is wild. So I have like photos of the end of the road <laughs> uh, where the road ends in the valley. And we took everyone by surprise. Every, they were just like, holy shit, the Americans are here. And, and, and not in a good way. There's other valleys we had been in that they were like, oh, who are you? The Afghan government? Like, nope, we're Americans. They're like, wow. Oh. All right, like they were just on, in their own planet. But this time it was, wasn't good. They were like, oh, the Americans are here. And so we got to the end of the road and it was fighting season. So all these military age males come out, which are at, we knew absolutely were fighters. So we're like, there's way too many men for the amount of ho homes in this village. <laughs> like it was, it was unsettling. And so we sat down and we met with the village elder and we talked, you know, just about small small talk, whatever. I had uh, drank tea, I kind of took photos, and I sat down with the village elder along with the special forces team as well. And we kind of sat and talked, and they drank tea with them and, and all this other stuff. In fact, some guys were like, look, I'm an AMP, and they took, you know, we're like, oh, cool, took a photo of his ID. You know, they're kind of friendly, and but everyone was eyeballing us. We're like, okay, like we're in enemy territory. We're deep in enemy territory right now. And the only reason they're not hitting us is because we basically woke them up. And so they're just kind of, looking around and we're taking it all in and you know and, and even then you know sad you know sadly we never got to the to the other villages so there was like the end of the road and then we saw more villages so we just couldn't get to them with the vehicle we and we ended up not going down even further down the valley so we had the the meeting everything goes well and we're like all right well there's we're, let's go back back south we'll mark our way back to the, our, our base and then we uh stopped and and uh Chief Warrant Officer Vose, who's Special Forces Chief Warrant, was like, hey, let's cut off and do a kind of a recon patrol and we'll parallel down the, 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 the we'll parallel the road, we'll take a riverbed and we'll, we'll patrol down through the villages and kind of behind the villages, almost, you know, kind of like through. Uh, so we, we dismounted and I always have this little detail in my head. I, uh, I uh, 
we so a little bit backtrack. So the new ETT team, one tac twelve, has came that morning to to basically start ripping rip Toa with us, left seat right seat. <laughs> so I had a Gunny Gunny Rogers was the new guy that or not new guy but part of the new team and he was on my patrol, and so we didn't know who who they really were, you know, like how do they operate. So. I was like, I was running a ball cap a lot. And I was like, so I, I dismount off of the ANA vehicle and he's coming with, and I'm like, it's like, ah, he's a gunnery sergeant. I don't know how anal he's gonna be. or he's some asshole or something. I didn't know, I never, I didn't speak a word to him, but he was coming on this patrol. And so I, I, I step off about 10 feet and I look back and I'm like, yeah, I'll go grab my helmet. <laughs> You know, because I was used to running around the valleys in like t-shirts and plate carrier and a ball cap. And so I grabbed my helmet, you know, thank God. And so uh, I throw on my helmet, like, all right, you know, and reluctantly. And then I, I, we start patrolling down. And it, it basically the element was four special forces guys, myself, Gunny Rogers, who was uh, new to the ETT. He just showed up that, like they rolled in at like 2.55 a.m. And then they hopped on the trucks with us to go at like 3 a.m. And about, uh, I think about eight, of my, eight to 12 of my Afghan recon platoon. So it was pretty small element per se. About 20 odd some guys. But, you know, when you're alone in the valleys, that's not a big element, especially in Afghanistan. So we started making our way uh, through some of the, the villages and then basically into a riverbed. And we're like, all right, we'll take the riverbed south. And uh, immediately we lost visual contact with our, our, you know, our gun trucks, our, our support element, that nowhere to be found. And, we're like, and, the, and they're, they're starting to move, and they're clearly moving faster than we are. So now they're south in the valley. And we're like, okay. And then over the radio, we start getting chatter. Like, we're about to get hit. Everyone be ready. We're about to get hit. Because villagers are walking up to our southern element, which was about 15, 20 clicks south. We're like, your guys are going to get hit. Just be ready. And so like a farmer came up to them like, you guys are gonna get hit. And so we relayed it, we're like, okay, you know, be ready. So I remember looking back at at uh, my Afghans and giving them a signal to, to put their AK off safety. And one of these kids, I still can see his face today, he just looked at me, he was like, oh my God. Like, it was, obviously it was like in Pashtu. <laughs> like, you know, uh, he's like, Allah, you know. And, uh, and he was just like, because he's alone, you know, I mean, this isn't like, hey, we have the BMPs and the Americans have three gun trucks and we're okay and air support's coming. Like, he is alone with us. And so he was just, looks back and passes it down and puts his weapon on fire, you know, and he's ready to rock and roll. So it was kind of tense, you know, we knew something was, was going to happen. And uh, so we started work, working our way down and we, you know, Vos, I remember was like, hey, let's keep taking the, the riverbed and see where it goes. And it, myself and Chu were like, well, let's try to get to some high ground here. And he's like, no, no, let's keep going this way. We're like, okay. So we kept doing it. And I remember the vegetation, so there's a riverbed, you know, and kind of about 20, 30 feet down and you have these kind of rock terraces almost, but there's a vegetation of canopy of like trees that just cover up the riverbed. It's, 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 it's like quite a beautiful place actually. And so, we were walking through and I kind of, my buddy stops, Shuey, he's leading the patrol and, and uh, he takes a knee and, and I get over and take a knee next to a tree and he looks back at me, he just looks at me, he goes, do you hear that? And I kind of just lean in and that's when it all kicks off. You know, Alak Akbar, and all hell breaks loose. The tree explodes next to me, just rapid machine gun fire shooting right down into us. And uh, I took shrapnel to the eye and my face. That was when I was, the first time I was wounded in the battle. I ended up taking shrapnel along my, my nose, my face, my I've almost lost my eye, uh, cut my face, everything like that. <clears throat> and then uh, we returned fire, just volleyed fire back. So it was just volley of fire just going back and forth. Had to get them off our, off our back. Started firing back and forth. And, and then uh, Stovall, who was the 18 Delta medic, SF medic, he, uh, he got hit in the leg. So basically we're, shooting back and forth and he's like, I'm hit. And I was like, okay. And so I ran over to him, you know, still taking uh, fire. And I looked at his leg and again, one of those like fun of fog of war, weird, funny things you remember. I, I whip out my K bar and I'm about to like <laughs> cut, cut up his leg. And he's like, hold on, careful. <laughs> And I, and I look at him, and he looks at me, I was like, oh yeah, I put my K-bar away. And then I took out my medical shears. I actually kept the medical shears on me because we were, we were actually, you know, we, we were really good at medical. We were trained on it, you know, and, and so I, oh yeah, <laughs> I got all excited, pull out a K-bar to cut it off his pants, you know. But I, I put it back and then I took the medical shears and, you know, and got it all, you know, got and he had a clean in and out. So I patched him up, got him rocking and rolling. I was like, all right, you're good, good to go. 
went back, kept fighting alongside Shuey, and then finally we were like, okay, we gotta get to some higher ground, you know, after this initial ambush. So we end up going up the side of the of the of this kind of riverbed rock terrace. And I remember this the canopy, it was like it was still covering us, giving us some sort of concealment. And we're kind of you know, bounding up, you know, and I remember Vose and we're bounding and he bounds past me, but it wasn't that far, and he stops and, and I like look at him. And he's like set and he kind of looked at me and smirked, because right about two feet more is gonna you're gonna break the canopy of the concealment and then basically your ass is hanging in the breeze <laughs> and so he looked back at me he goes set and smirks and I literally looked at him and said you mother and I literally <laughs> so laughing and I, I went past him and broke through you know the canopy per se and, and the concealment that we had and it's just like the valley it, it, you see everything and it's you know they're still firing on us you know the whole thing like we're completely exposed. So we get up, we get behind a rock wall terrace. I get everybody up, you know, we're firing, shooting back, get everybody kind of online. And then we start, start picking off, you know, targets and, and start picking off Taliban that are maneuvering on us and all sorts of stuff. You know, we're uh, lit up, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, you know, everyone thinks like, you know, they ask questions, do you ever kill anybody? It's like, well, you know, most people have the answer of no, because you're either shooting at, you know, uh, buildings or you're going to suppress a fire. But, you know, I, I didn't get my first kills until my third deployment. And it, and it was in that battle. And that's when uh, I had, I had an M14A1 and, and uh, these two guys took off running with machine guns. And they were, you know, Taliban, so I just immediately like, whip over, drop them, just drop them. And, you know... There was one, I, I admit it, I, I'm embarrassed by it, but I got all excited. And there was one guy popped around a corner and I, I was shocked because he came around this finger and there's about you know, 15, 20 of us lined up. And I see him and I'm like, holy shit. Like, it's just one of those things where you're like, they just blatantly came around the corner with like an AK. He's just like, comes around the corner, not suspecting to see us. Comes around this corner and I, I have him in the crosshairs, I'm like, just shocked. Just it's shocked that he just casually walks around this corner. And he stops, he looks at us. I get, I was like, oh, I, I just like excited. I pulled the shot, hit right by his foot. I go back for a follow on shot because he turns and he's like, I saw his face. He's like, oh shit. He turns, starts running. I hit right by his foot, go on for a follow on, and the dude just, just gets ripped apart. It was basically like, online volley fire <laughs> like everyone saw him at the same time and so we were like oh we got him <laughs> you know but he was a uh, you know and then after that the the two guys popped up and i smoked those two guys running down the finger or kind of running along this like i don't want to say like a little ridge but you know they weren't far from us but it was kind of like next next little like ridge over i guess you would say but it wasn't far and uh come to find out later you know they was those were high value targets they're jpel targets so uh, that were on that finger so that was, I don't say cool knowing that, but it was, it was, those guys are, they were, they were hunting for a very long time. And at the end, I'll, you know, I'll kind of emphasize why everything went the way it did. So, you know, I smoked those two guys, put them down, and then we're still just getting fire from multiple positions. Um, you know, trying to, we're trying to get a good foothold. Um, trying to get, I'm not calling in for air support quite yet. You know, we're, we're in a pickle, but we're not, you know, we're not, it's not completely gone to yet but we are getting hit from three different sides and so we're holding our own i go over to towards the road i said okay everything by that time you know more stuff happened but basically the overall is you know we were things were like uh covered everyone was good doing their job i was like all right i'm gonna go to the west side and i'm gonna try to see if we can get back to the road so i bound over take the west side to see if we can say hey well, let's start getting these guys so i actually jump onto this one side of the rock wall Face like on the west side of this rock wall, thinking, all right, they're shooting at us from this direction, I'll be good. Now I'm sitting there, I'm kind of scanning the area, kind of looking back, okay, the road's that way, I'm looking this way. And then I, it, I, I thought I got hit with an RPG, like straight up. It was just, I remember the explosion, or what I thought was an explosion. Everything goes black, and then the next thing I know, I'm running. So, and that's kind of what was crazy about it was, I was, I took off running. I mean, like I said, every, it was an explosion. Everything, it goes like black, but I'm, I'm back at it. And I'm, the next thing I know, I'm running 
and my neck is on fire, my forearm's on fire, and I'm assessing my wounds as I'm running. So I literally, I'm like, okay, my blood's not pumping out of my neck. Like I don't feel anything wet. I don't, it's hot, but it's not, you know, uh, like I don't feel any blood running down me. Bullets are kicking up all around me. And I just remember saying to myself, you're not dead yet, so keep fighting. That was it, that's all that went through my head. And, I, and so I'm running and all these, the bullets were kicking up all around me, it was a machine gun. I was getting hit with a machine gun, a PKM. And so I'm running down this rock wall and the path is starting to come up a little bit and the rock wall is still the same height, or the, it's, the height's starting to reduce. And I was like, I have to jump over this wall, but if I stop, I'm gonna get up because I'm gonna get shot up with a machine gun. So I like, my mind was just like calculating, you know, a, a billion times a second, just like, and then back, and I, I remember seeing my Afghan sniper, one of my DDMs, he just looked at me and he's like, come on, come on, <laughs> you know, like, and, and so, come to me. And uh, so I'm running and then I, I finally get to a point where I feel like I can jump over the rock wall. So I go over and jump on over and, uh, start returning fire, start, you know, engaging guys that are now to the west of us. Now we're surrounded. Gunny, Rogers, I thought he was dead. So I'm like, well, I can't leave him behind. So I call out for him, because he's face down in this terrace, in this farming terrace. I was like, he's dead. Like, I gotta go get him, I gotta go get his body. And I call for him, doesn't answer. Call for him, doesn't answer. And I'm like, I'm gonna call for him one more time. And if he doesn't answer, I have to coordinate with my Afghan to cover for me because I'm gonna go grab the body and bring it over the rock wall to get the safety. He answers, I call out, he answers the third time. And he's like, he's almost like playing dead. And he's, I was like, you okay? And he's like, ah, I'm okay. I was like, all right, well, you know, on the count of three, I'm gonna get, you know, lay down cover fire and, uh, you know, get over to me. And so it's count of three, gave him a count, you know, one, two, three, and he just got up and started running zigzags, you know, traditional little zigzag infantry tag. He's like, ah, 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 you know, and, and I'm just, you know, engaging dudes that are trying to shoot at him. And, and then he jumps on the rock wall and I'm literally having one hand on my M14 firing and I'm dragging, I'm pulling him over the rock wall to safety. And then so I get him over and then he's, uh, you know, check him out. I was like, you good? I was like, hey, check my, you know, because I knew I got hit. I was like, how does it look? How's everything? Am I bleeding? Am I dying? You know, like, just check. And he's like, no, you're good. I was like, awesome. Get on my radio. Antenna had gotten ripped out of my M biter. And so it's gone. So comms are gone. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this is absolute worst case scenario. Now we're surrounded on all three sides and I don't have any type of communication other than maybe a cell phone. But that's, that's if we were like absolutely, I mean, that, it got to that point where we're, you know, we could have used it per se, but also relaying stuff back to the, to the talk and all such stuff, it, it would almost, wouldn't have been as effective. So uh, the, my radio is gone, it's, I can't communicate, you know, we're in the middle of this valley, surrounded on all sides, and that's when everything really opened up, and that's when they really started to hit us. And then uh, I uh, was engaging targets on the west side, and then all I hear is man down, and man down, and it was the radio operator, um, Justin Aflog, and he was, kept screaming it. It, it, was, it was kind of a haunting yell too because you could tell the distress in his voice. Like it wasn't like, man down, man, you know, gotta do this or whatever. It was just screaming. Like he, it was his friend, Vos had gotten hit and they were good friends. And you could just tell in his voice, like he was a bit shook. Like it was a very distressing call. So I kept asking, I was shouting back, and you know, we were shouting, and I just was like, how bad is it? You know, because I need to hold this west side. How bad is it? And he just kept screaming and kept screaming. It was almost like a scream for help. Like, he was just like, okay, this is bad. He can't think right now. And so I looked at, at Gunny, and I said, you know, can you hold the west side? He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll hold. I was like, okay. And so I just, I said, I'm gonna go, gonna go help. And so I ran over, and it was like these kind of rock terraces. I was jumping down some rock terraces and just sprinting as fast as I could to get to, to Vos and to Aflag, and come to find out later, my buddy Shuey told me that he goes, "Yeah, I saw. I turned around and saw you running, and bullets were and RPGs were flying over your head, and you're you know basically running through hail of gunfire." And I was like, "Really? <laughs> you know, I, I just got zoned in, and just I needed to get to him. Like you know, it's one of those things where you leave leave no man behind, but you also want to at the time you know find a job, stay busy. I'm just not gonna like let." Affleck freak out and, and, or, you know, his friend just got hit. I don't expect him to, to, you know, immediately go to medical aid and all this stuff. And like, so, and I knew what I was doing. I had experience with that. So I was like, okay, boom, I'm gonna get right to it. 
and uh, got to Vos, and he had basically had a kind of a, a sucking chest wound. He got shot like right above his plate and then right down uh, down lower, but it hit other organs. We kind of, kind of found out later. So I get to him, and the where he got shot too was kind of like on this lip and on a little trail and like this lip, and I jump over a rock wall, and he's laying there, and it's like the he's your ass is hanging in the breeze. Like it, it's the va the whole valley. It's like it's almost like the whole valley could see this one spot. That's what it felt like. So I, I'm looking around like this is bad, and so I jump on him and I look at Justin. I said, Justin, get on the radio, get me a bird. You know you can do it. Like I'll take care of those. And he looked at me. He's like, okay, okay. And I was like, I'll take care of those. Just get us the medevac, you know, get us on the radio. And he's like, okay, kind of calmed them down a little bit. And then I started working on Vos and it was just, I could feel the overpressure of all the, all the like just machine gun fire all around me. I could just feel, feel it over my head. They're shooting at us. You know, we were surrounded on all sides. I'm engaging, you know, in between working on them. Like I had to cut it off, I cut off his, his plate carrier and uh, start working on them, start patching them up, and then I'd return fire again, and then patch them up and return fire again. And, uh, you know, at one point I, I took out my pistol because it was just easier than grabbing the rifle. And I had my hand on, uh, on his chest with a bandage, and then I'm, you know, engaging guys with my pistol to keep them off us. And, um, you know, it was truly at that point that I was like, okay, like if I die here, I die here, and that's okay. Like, I'm not gonna let him one, die alone, or two, get his body taken. Because at that point, too, they, I knew they were trying to take his body. They saw someone down. They clearly saw it in the daylight. They are going to try to take this body. They are going to try to overrun us. And that's what they were trying to do. I mean, we were getting so much fire. Um, again, the fog of war, about probably 10, 20 meters away, uh, uh, the medic, Stovall, and my buddy Shuey, who was a 18 Bravo, they were throwing grenades. It was all within grenade distance. They were, so they are throwing grenades back and forth. And, um, you know, I'm engaging dudes to get off us, like, kind of, like, about 20 meters away, just, like, using the pistol, and then I get back down again, and then, you know, uh, pick up the rifle, start shooting that. And I, I remember seeing his, f the look on Vose's face was, like, he actually got better. Like, he was, like, kind of took a breath. His eyes came back. He's looking. And, um, and, and I was, like, oh, shit, he's going to make it. I was, like, this is great. He's going to make it. But... As the battle went on and, and, and Stovall came over, uh, who's the medic, and we kept working on him, like he started to fade back again. And that's when it was just like, we just need to get him out of here. Like we're surrounded, we can't get him, we can't move him. And it's all about the medevac at this point. Um, and so we're engaging, Stovall had a saw. So at one point we're working on him and I just pick up the saw and just start raking all these positions that are absolutely hammering us. So there was a point where we were, I was working on them and it just wasn't looking good. I was like, F you know, and I was like, we're surrounded. They're closing in on us. And I, I remember I look up and I see two Taliban fighters going up a hill, going to a position that I, I saw and I was like, they're going to see us and they're going to just F light us up. And I remember seeing them run up this hill and I'm working on Vos and I look up and I see it and I go, I remember saying to myself, like, it's going to be a long day. And just like out of a movie, two fing rockets come in like boom blow them up and then 50 cal just right up the hillside and i look over and it's like kiowa and kiowas just start screaming in the rockets are you know and i was like holy shit like this oh you know and then like it just breathed life back into us you know and and so that was awesome so, so they, they start engaging but some of those guys are too close that they can't they can't engage so they're engaging the targets that they can and then um you know, and then that's when the next el the, the the southern element finally got to us, the gun trucks and everything. And um, you know, my buddy Gilbert like runs past us, and uh, you know, Miel is like Gilbert, and he's just like holding his position. You know, he's just zoned in. He's a he's a corpsman, and so I was like Gilbert, you know, and he's like oh oh shit, like he he just he wouldn't even know we were there, you know, and so I like, call him over and and I was like hey, you need to take him, like you know, I'm gonna hand off the duties to you now, like work on him, I need to check the perimeter, I need to check on my Afghans, you know, we're still in it, we're still in the fight, but we know the west side now is covered because we have the gun trucks over there and they, that's what they maneuvered from. So I jump down and check on my Afghans and then the medevac is coming in, so we get a, f a few more reinforcements 
and we knew they were going to try to shoot down the bird. And so what I did was is we coordinated with the medevacs to, that they're going to do one fake, and then the second bird was going to come in. And it was like there's barely any room to land, and these guys were phenomenal. So. I said, okay, it was like, as soon as the bird comes in, I got everyone lined up. I said, here's the target, so they are, they're clearly shooting at us. It's like, as soon as the bird starts, second bird starts coming in, light everything up. So I coordinated like basically a counter attack or counter fire to make sure that the bird didn't get shot down. So as soon as the second bird came in, I, you know, scream, you know, you know, fire and everyone just lit up and we started engaging targets and, and it did work because you could tell the machine gun fire started slowing down and then the RPGs went over that over the bird. So we managed to, to give down enough cover fire to, uh, um, to distract them or to essentially have them throw them off of, of the bird, of the medevac bird coming in. So they got those in there and then um, they got them on the medevac bird and, and got them out of there. And, and uh, even the, the guys that were on the, on the Black Hawk jumped off it. My buddy Shuey like ran Vos into the to the Black Hawk, and then those guys that came off it that you know like the security element on the Black Hawk, they jump out, and he said, he said I saw the guy on their face, they just went what the fuck, and then they just started it like put up the rifles and just start engaging guys, and so we got them, or they got Vos on, carried him on, got him on the medevac, got him on the medevac bird, got him out, um, and then uh, gathered up my guys and. You know, it was uh, one of those things I made sure everyone was good, and then uh, we started making our way back to the west side, to the gun trucks. And, uh, uh, you know, myself, I was with Shuey, me and him were like the last ones off the battlefield. You know, I made sure everything was good, and I was the last one out of the patrol, out of that area. And, um, yeah, we got to the gun trucks, and, you know, there's, it was like a, kind of that moment, and you're just like, relief. You know, there's and you know, six Humvees just armed to the teeth. You know, I see my team leader. I had been shot bumped twice. They were kind of like, what happened, you know? And, and I'm kind of miserable, you know? And, and um, so we ended up working our way south. And then uh, we still were getting in contact with like RPGs and machine guns, the front element. And then we just kind of engaged and just forced our way back. And then we got back to the FOB and that was the end of it. But come to find out, what happened was, was there's a really big, uh, basically head honcho meeting of Taliban leaders, uh, you know, uh, anti-coalition forces that were meeting just so happened for about three or four days in our valley when we went up to do this patrol. So there's all these top Taliban leaders and they basically wanted to flex. It was like a target of opportunity and they had their fighters in the valley. So they were like, all right, we're going to these dudes up. And so that's essentially what happened, is it was just a coincidence that they were there and we did the patrol. And so they coordinated the attack. They hit all of our elements. There was a R element, a mid element, and then the southern element. And then they, they hit them all, all at the same time. Basically, our element got hit with about, uh, I believe it was probably 7,500 strong. And, you know, overall, all the other, you know, probably 1,150, you know, and maybe more of hitting all the elements to slow them down from coming to get us. So the guys that were fighting their way up the valley, they were just engaging dudes left and right, like almost just running through the villages. Like there's some you know, little villages along the way and they're just shooting in every direction, just trying to get to us and they're, they're hitting them to slow them down so that they could overrun us. Um, and uh, yeah, and we ended up killing three high value targets. Um, some of the tier one units came down and we're like, what the f but thank you. And then, uh, you know, uh, and we were like, we didn't plan it, <laughs> you know, like, don't thank us. It was just coincidence. And, uh, but there, it was, uh, there were some targets there that had killed, um, Kiowa pilots. And so they were, you know, were the pilots were like, Hey, anything you need from us, you know, we're in debt to you. Um, and, uh, so that was kind of a silver lining, you know, it sucked losing Vos. It was, you know, and it was a loss for the SF team. And, um, you know, we ended up killing well over 25 fighters uh, just by a hand count that I, I talked to all my buddies and the SF guys just by a rough like numbers. There was over 25 Taliban killed and, and the report says more, but it, you know, it's uh, it, it relied on intel. But um, like guys that we knew that we put down visibly, we knew was over 25. Um, so yeah, and um, years later, 
uh, I was nominated for the Silver Star, and I was awarded the Silver Star for uh, actions under fire and, and um, you know, uh, basically protecting Vos from being taken by the Taliban, you know, being, from being overrun, holding our ground, and then, you know, basically holding, holding the Taliban back from taking his body. So um, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I kind of think back on that and, and, um, and the mentality of everything that I was trained to do taking it to heart and, and, and being tested and, you know, like everyone goes to combat and, it, and it's awesome and it's, you know, and they, they kind of prove themselves, but to be put in that situation, to be like, you know, this is, is it's not just a motto on a t-shirt. It's not just a motto you stick on a poster or, or a recruiting slogan. It truly is like, I'm going to die here. I'm going to uh, accept death and that's okay. And I'm going to, you know, die. If I die, I die here and I'm going to die in a pile of grass protecting, you know, one of my brothers in arms, you know, a special forces soldier, and I'm not going to let him die alone. So, and they're not going to take his body. And I'm going to give every ounce I can to that. And to kind of live through that, I think that's pro you know, like, uh, that's when I probably get emotional about stuff because that truly, you know, it, people talk about it. And, and um, you know, I think just that, the, the, just that feeling of like, Hey, this is this is the end, but that's okay. And uh, you know, if this is what I have to do, this is what I have to do. You know, that that type of sacrifice, like to go through it, accept it, and then come out on the other end, is you know, uh, you know. Sadly, Vos didn't make it, but you know, and um, you know, there's nothing that we could do more. It was just time. You know, uh, we couldn't get the medevac birds in. You know, I, you know. I always say, yeah, he probably could have made it if we were next to a hospital. If he got shot, we managed to get him into a, you know, like right away or something. But also not, it wasn't just a clean in and out sucking chest wound. It had gone down and hit another organ. And so he was like internally bleeding plus the sucking chest wound. So it was a lot more complicated than that. Um, but yeah, so that was that. <laughs>